Sajid Chinoy, Chief India Economist at JP Morgan. He joins in to talk about a variety of things. Uh, I want to talk to him about one, uh, the biggest problem in the minds of investors right now world over, and that is what's happening to Turkey and the Lira and the contagion effects, if any. There's also India-specific things to discuss. IP numbers look solid. Inflation numbers have shown signs of cooling off. I wouldn't call this a trend. So, so much to speak about. He joins us right now on the show. Sajid, so good having you. Thanks so much for taking the time out. I want to start off with uh, the, the bigger issue at hand, at least in the minds of almost all of us who track markets on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's what's happened to the Lira and the Turkish economy and the fears of contagion. Now, the views are divided out there, Sajid. Some people believe that European banks have exposure. It will show in their PNL. And eventually, there will be a sentimental contagion, if not an actual contagion. There is an equal set of people who believe that we don't know, quite know the extent of the impact that this can have on Asia per se. Uh, how, have, how have you distilled the noise? And what are your thoughts on what this could do if this worsens? Morning, it's a great question. I, I think there are several parts to this. I think the first thing is, uh, that you know, uh, policymakers in Turkey need to stop the bleeding, need to stop the hemorrhaging here, and I think you know what the experience of emerging market crises over the last 20 years has shown us is that number one, you require a set of confidence-building measures. Policymakers always need to be ahead of the market in terms of ensuring that markets not don't lose confidence. The second is there is a very real macroeconomic adjustment that's required in Turkey. Turkey has a gross financing requirement of you know, $240 billion over the next year. They only have reserves of $80 billion. Inflation is running close to 20%. Uh, the current account deficit is you know, upwards of 5% of GDP. So the second lesson of crisis is you want to spread that macro adjustment across different policy levels and not concentrate that on any one policy level because that's typically suboptimal. So I think what we first need to see is some set of announcements by policy makers in Turkey to just build confidence again. We need something on monetary policy, something on, uh, on fiscal policy, something on how the debt repayment will be managed. I think if that is done to start with, that could you know, uh, reverse sentiment to some extent. Number two, we need a very real macro adjustment over the next year. And the question mark is you know, how prepared is Turkey to accept lower growth uh, to, to restore macroeconomic stability? These are difficult and important questions, but that's what's the need of the hour. In terms of contagion, I think the, at least on Asia, the direct impact of contagion is, is very, very limited. The exposure of Asian banks uh, to Turkey, very limited. The exposure is more from European banks and banks in the Gulf. Uh, there's about $200 billion of, uh, of, 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 of liabilities there and an unknown amount of derivatives. But I think mainly the contagion to the rest of the world is going to be through, uh, through sentiment. And I think emerging markets with current account deficit countries like India, South Africa, Brazil have gotten buffeted by two or three phenomena in the last month. One is a stronger dollar because US growth has been so strong. The second has been a weaker Chinese currency because China is worried about a trade war. And the third now is that one of its peers, so to speak, is under pressure. So I think the, the contagion impact on the rest of emerging markets is more sentiment driven. And what you tend to find is once the initial panic settles down, markets become much more discriminating. And from that perspective, India's fundamentals are still very strong and much stronger than they were in 2013. So hopefully the impact oh, you know, in, the, in, in the medium term will be, will be very limited. So there might not be exaggerated reactions, Sajid, uh, from what you are saying. But uh, if this were to you know, worsen even slightly from where it is right now, and well, if Erdogan is to be believed right now, he's not showing any signs of backing off. Uh, so whether this, whether the strong US economy or whether the Chinese issue that you spoke about, fundamentally, is there a case for the currency to be under, Indian currency to be under further pressure? Or do you believe this is the extent of the damage that we could see in the near term? You know, it all depends on what happens to the dollar and what happens to other emerging market currencies. Hypothetically, if the dollar were to strengthen further, or you know, the lira were to continue falling, you will have at least a little more of this contagion effect around the world. And in that environment, it's, it's very hard to, uh, to, to stem the flow. Uh, you know, you're almost wasting foreign exchange reserves if the sell-off around the world is systemic, if it's enveloping all emerging markets. So uh, one can never say never. If the dollar were to strengthen further, 
or things get worse in Turkey, uh, it's entirely possible that all emerging market currencies could depreciate further and in that environment, so will the rupee. What's the JP Morgan base case and what is your own personal thought out here? What's the base case, Sajid? You know, I, I think it's less meaningful to talk about a bilateral dollar rupee rate. I know psychologically that's important. But from an economy-wide perspective, I think what policymakers and central banks look at are what is the trade-weighted rate, right? So it's entirely possible that if the rupee were to weaken going forward, uh, uh, it just in line with all of its trading partners, then yes, the, the rupee could be weaker against the dollar, but against a broad basket of currencies, which is what matters for the economy, the rupee would still be at the same level. I think the RBI and other central banks look at those trade-weighted rates. So in other words, if other trading partner currencies weaken and uh, the dollar were to strengthen, I don't think there, is, there should be any sanctity to say that the rupee should not go below 70 or 71. It will depend entirely on relative currency movements. So I think, therefore, with all these moving pieces, it's not meaningful to have today a target on what the dollar rupee rate is going to be. It's going to depend on how other currencies pan out. I mean, people speculated the rupee will not breach 69, and it breached 69 easily in one day because there was so much stress around the world. I'll just say one more thing, Neeraj. One is that if you look at this trade-weighted rate, uh, the Indian currency has actually strengthened a lot, uh, not weakened. Between 2014 and 2018, the trade-weighted rupee in real terms uh, appreciated almost 20 percent. Right? Uh, in the last six months, it has, on a trade-weighted basis, given up only 6 percent of that. So we're still much stronger compared to 2014. And therefore, from the standpoint of competitiveness, it's not a bad thing if the rupee were to gradually, this has to be gradual and uh, uh, you know, uh, calibrated, if the rupee were to gradually weaken, at a minimum it would need to weaken as much as its trading partners. Hmm. Yeah, and excuse me, Sajid, if I sounded like I was asking for a level, I wasn't, just wanted to know your base case. But, uh, you know, Sajid, uh, I remember the last year, the JPM conference, um, you guys and your team were amongst the first ones to talk about, um, one, the equities and how they might be reaching a bit of a peaking point, but two, also flagging off the fact that uh, the leeway for foreigners to buy into Indian bonds was so restricted that at some point of time the yields will move up from where they were and I, I believe they have. My, my question to you is uh, that problem seems to be behind us. The last four odd months, the last two odd policies, while we moved from 7 to 7.8, 7.9, we seem to be in or around those levels now for the last couple of months at least and two policies have gone by since then. Um, what's your sense of what happens in the near term, especially with the kind of data that we've seen coming out yesterday? Uh, so so my, uh, my sense is, you know, we, we've had a string of uh, 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 quite uh, strong core inflation momentum prints for the last six months, and I think that's what got people concerned, because now if you look ahead and look at inflation in the first half of 2019, the Reserve Bank of India itself believes that uh, inflation is going to be close or above 5 percent, meaningfully above the 4 percent inflation target. Now, I think yesterday's print uh, gives everybody some relief here. I think the, the headline print undershot expectations, but I think the more important information was contained in the details. And what you found is the internals of the print were even softer. Uh, it, I mean, what will give policymakers a lot of relief? What we saw yesterday was the momentum of core inflation, month on month, seasonally adjusted which had been tracking 0.5% for eight months, which in other words, that's a 6% annualized rate. That 0.5% momentum in June was revised down to 0.2, and in July that fell further to 0.1. So at least for two months in a row, you've seen the momentum of core inflation gap down. Now, you know, it's too early to call victory. In the past, we've seen a couple of months of you know, soft momentum and then things pick, up, pick back up. So let's wait and see if this trend persists. Complementing that was the fact that you're not seeing any big food price increases yet. The seasonal increase in food prices this year is more muted than typical, and we're not seeing any impact of MSPs just as yet on paddy, for example. So all told, I think from an RBI's perspective, a good inflation print, and I think with the RBI having moved in back-to-back -back meetings, uh, you know, unless there are some very large unforeseen developments, I think the, yesterday's print gives the central bank enough space to stay on hold at the, uh, the October policy review. Mm -hmm. Sajid, my last question, because of uh, you know, the lack of uh, 
all comprehensive data that the IP may have uh, you know, maybe capturing in the recent past, a lot of people have stopped giving credence to the IP release. Though the release, the last one that came out, uh, seemed to be very impressive. Have you read into it, or have, are you reading something into this? Yeah, I, you're right. I think we should look at the totality of what the high frequency data is telling us. Uh, the recent data flow has been encouraging. IIP was revised up very sharply and inflation has been revised down a little bit. But I think if you look at the broader uh, 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 mix of data, here's what you find that uh, we had a very impressive growth recovery for about two quarters. Uh, and now there's this sectoral divergence where services uh, activity seems to be holding up quite well. Uh, but industrial activity and manufacturing, despite the fact that IIP was revised up for a couple of months, is still softer than the end of last year. So I see that there is this sectoral divide that's opening up, where industry is a little bit better than we thought, but meaningfully softer than the, the, the last four months of 2017. Uh, and services, however, continues to, uh, continues to impress. I think the way to make sense of this is to say services, for the most part, are more non-tradable in nature. And domestic demand is holding up quite nicely. Uh, the industrial part is a little bit more levered to the export cycle exports have slightly disappointed and therefore industry growth hasn't been as buoyant. I think this is the message that comes through in the credit growth data, in the PMI surveys, uh, and in the, and the high frequency mix more generally. Sajid Chinoy, always a pleasure having you. Thank you so much for taking the time out today and giving us your lowdown on the, more, the bigger elephant in the room, which is the Turkish Lira and the Turkey problems, but also the Indian data. Much appreciate your time. Sure thing. Well, that's the view from Sajid Chennai of JP Morgan. Uh, we'll, of course, be talking to him when their, when their India conference is underway in the month of September as well.